Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood. We are joined by a very special guest, uh, Tarek Haddad. Tarek, thank you so much for taking time out with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. So to my audience, um, th this the Action for Assange people introduced us because mm -hmm. you've had, um, we, I've done several videos and any my, anybody watching this right now, if you haven't, please go to my playlist. I've done several videos on the leaked OPCW reports that have shown basically how they lied us into a war with Syria. That's the, the, mm -hmm. the crux of it. So most of my viewers probably know that. For those of you watching that don't, uh, please get up to speed on that as we, as we go into this. So why, um, I wanted to talk with you is you basically, and you can walk us all through this, you, you tried to cover this story and they told you not to. So why don't you just explain to us um, mm -hmm. what happened and how you've, your investigative journalism has kind of shown a, 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 a bigger um, plot mm -hmm. or motive. Sure. Um, firstly, I think it's kind of important to understand that I'm kind of familiar with the media landscape. So I know that um, there's things that are difficult to say in the media. For example, I've known for a very long time that the whole narrative around Syria is a big deception, as I'm sure many people have. Um, but to kind of, and I knew the magnitude of this story is that it would implicate that the whole war is a lie. Um, so, so, I, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just tell everybody, you, just give us a quick, your, your journalistic background so we know mm -hmm. where you came from. Perfect. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so I I did a finance degree, finished in 2012, worked in finance for two years, and then kind of while I was working in finance, I saw how corrupt that was. I trained to be a journalist with the Press Association, which is the like England's equivalent of the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I did kind of a bunch of work experience things with national newspapers and local newspapers. Okay. Um, okay. Then Hull Daily Mail, which is a local newspaper, one of the best in the UK for regional news. So kind of did the typical work your way up from the bottom, um, going to court, government meetings and, you know, that kind of local news type of stuff. Um, in 2016, I started working at the International Business Times or IB Times UK, okay. which was... Um, at the time, it, it had just bought Newsweek, so the two organizations were related to each other. Um, worked there for about a year and a little while, um, started to become very interested. Well, I was always interested in foreign affairs, so I was always writing a lot about Syria and international politics. Um, and then, I believe, yeah, 2017, I believe, I took two years away from journalism. Um, I kind of felt like I couldn't write as realistically as I, as honestly as I wanted to about certain issues. And I kind of, you know, Syria was one of them. I felt like I couldn't really tell the truth. So I wanted to try and write a book for two years, difficult process, obviously, and, um, had to kind of grow up and get, start make, making money again. So, um, <laughs> in, in September of last year, I, um, was like, okay, I need to kind of go back to journalism, start, building a career again, had my old connections from the International Business Times, same, a lot of the same editors. So I was able to get an interview and apply and I got the job at Newsweek covering foreign affairs, um, kind of same stuff I was doing before. Um, so in about mid-November, I believe, Donald Trump announced um, he was withdrawing troops from Syria and then a week or a few days later, um, Turkey kind of launched its invasion into northern Syria and you know just as I would normally would on all sorts of foreign affairs issues I started you know I was asked to write about this and I think this is all important actually because you know when I tried to write my story about the OPCW my editors were kind of trying to say that I didn't have the credibility to write about it or I didn't have the expertise it was part of this kind of big essentially trying to smear who I was as a journalist but you know, I was getting praised for articles that I'd written about Syria in the past or other things, or, you know, I was getting emails from the, you know, um, CEO of the company saying great job on some of my articles. But then it was when I started to try and write about Syria in the kind of the narrative, the counter narrative is when I started to get criticized. Um, but anyway, so just so to clarify here, when you were writing the sort of American empire 
uh, Russia and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Assad are bad, that, that was permissible. But when you started kind of uncovering it, that's when they said, oh, suddenly you're not credible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the kind of typical thing that happens in journalism when a chemical, uh, you know, or t kind of a, a local court level, for example, a local newspaper, or if you want to say that someone's committed a theft or a, a, a murder or something, you know, we take it very seriously to make sure we've got all the evidence to, to say that before we say that someone's a murderer or it has to be proven in court. But when I, we have this kind of inverse thing when, you know, the most serious crimes against humanity will, you know, every newspaper around the world will be willing to publish it within a day. Yeah. And I always, you know, I always try to say, let's call for an independent investigation or wait for an independent investigation. And just sometimes just trying to say that can get you the tag of being an Assad apologist, just saying, can we have a investigation from the United Nations or the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons? So that's, I and that's, that's what we saw with this this, this leak, is that mm -hmm. the, the the OPCW people within it were like, wait a minute, we need a full investigation yet, and they were just you know be quiet, and and then the coalition started bombing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I don't know from there if you want me to go back to kind of the timeline of events. Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, do the timeline of events. Um, so um, anyway, so. Turkey in this in this invasion start, uh, allegedly used white phosphorus. So I started to investigate some of the issues around that, and that got me kind of dealing to uh, dealing with a lot of people in that kind of area of chemical weapons and uh, the watchdogs and the uh, International Committee for the Red Cross. So I was talking to all those people, started to hear all these things that we now know about the OPCW. Um, like I said before, you know I know that certain things are difficult to print. So, um, but with this, it, it reached a certain point. That I thought this evidence is 100% solid. You know, not only did we have the documents from WikiLeaks, um, you know, several well-respected journalists have written about it. And it also just kind of fit into my whole understanding of the narrative of history and, and many things I've seen. I've got evidence of uh, staging in other chemical weapons attacks, alleged chemical weapons attacks. So these things were already on my mind. So the reason I guess I, I pushed my case and I didn't just say I'm not writing this story I, or I didn't want to back down because um, I'm sorry, I'm talking 100 miles an hour trying to <laughs> squeeze everything in. But um, yeah, so the reason that never in my experience had um, if other journalists had written about something or if it was in Reuters, which these documents were ver verified by Reuters, I was never told I couldn't write a story because you know, I'd have I'd had the approval of other journalists in other industries, uh, in other publications. Um, so it was when I was told this was not, uh, couldn't do it for these reasons. And also for the reasons of, um, I was told that the main reason is that Bellingcat, which is this kind of so-called group of investigative journalists, um, you know, kind of said that all these leaks were not to be taken seriously and that all this shows nothing. But obviously for people that, or for people that don't know, um, Bellingcat is essentially just a propaganda arm of the US military. Um, it's funded by National Endowment for Democracy and has various links to various think tanks that essentially it's just, you know, it's this propaganda, propaganda arm. Right. Um, so right. I was given these reasons I, you know, I, I said that wasn't acceptable. Um, we can go from there, I guess. <laughs> I'm trying to, there's a hundred details to squeeze in and I'm trying to. Sure. I, yeah. So yeah, I think most of my audience is aware, but for mm -hmm. those of you who don't, yes, Bellingcat is, is clearly just a mouthpiece for the state department and they help push this sort of narrative. And the thing we've mm -hmm. talked about a lot on this show is how um, it seems like all these different media sources are confirming the same thing when in fact they're all sort of getting their marching orders from the State Department. Um, right. And Bellingcat is a part of that. So you can say, oh, this independent source is confirming mm -hmm. this thing. And it's like, no, they're, they're just getting State Department talking points. And then when Stephen Colbert calls Tulsi Gabbard an Assad apologist on late night TV, it's like even the late night comedians are saying it. No, no, no. Yeah. He's getting State Department talking points because he he's represented uh, by big talent agencies <laughs> that are also 
uh, influenced by that. So, so let's take it from there now. Bellingcat, uh, and this is where you started to get some serious pushback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I kind of, instead of just, well, I, I raised the points about their funding and said to my editors that, you know, this is clearly a not a worth, worth um, not a trustworthy source. So I, but instead, I said that, but I also kind of took apart the Bellingcat article about this OPCW leaks, and I refuted all of the points that they made. And then when they, my editor still said no, that's when I kind of realized, okay, there's something more going on here. Um, and then so I investigate. I decided to look into one of my <laughs> editors, was the one that was kind of dictating everything, because I noticed, first of all, some slightly strange behavior in terms of... Um, he was the foreign affairs editor, but he never actually did any foreign affairs editing. It was only when I tried to write, he only got involved in stories when I wanted to write about anything controversial. Mm. So uh, when I did any any of my pieces about chemical weapons, and I had like hints when I was doing those stories that, you know, he kind of toned down the language when I said anything critical about United States or Israel, for example. Um, so I, I started kind of noticing that this is slightly suspect. And then I looked into his background and that's when it kind of everything sort of became very clear to me is that he is uh, the editor involved was called Demi Ryder. He was a fellow at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Um, and, you know, so I kind of realized that actually, you know, everyone knows about the military industrial complex um, and how the, how pernicious that is and how that operates. I never knew that the military industrial complex was actually had swept in all of the media because what the Council of Foreign Relations does is that, you know, it has um, these fellowships and these programs where journalists come in, people from the State Department come in, military contractors, and they're all kind of working in the same environment together. And then they'll go back out to, to where they were in, in newsrooms and, and so on. Um, and, you know, I, I demonstrated this this kind of pattern of how it happened with um, Fareed Zakaria in my piece. Mm -hmm. So um, with journalism, it seems to have this kind of very specific trend of they go to one of the top tier universities like Yale or Harvard, do a um, like a policy studies degree or some. And it's usually funded by the U.S. State Department from the U.S. State uh, from that degree. They'll go to a. Council of Foreign Relations publication or a publication that's funded by um, certain other uh, State Department think tanks. And then from there, they'll start filtering through to newsrooms. Um, and so that I think that's what, and this was the editor that was kind of telling me, you know, Bellingcat have said this is a no-go, but he's getting his, you know, he, he seemed very, actually very pally with Elliot Higgins, who's the founder of... Mm. Uh, Bellingcat, and you know, he was more than happy to keep, you know, saying how great his work is. So that's, I think that's why you have this blanket silence on so many stories, because there's actually editors that are, you know, essentially their careers are funded by the State Department, um, which was news to me. And I've, I've studied propaganda for several years. And I, I didn't, I never thought that this, it was that bad. But um, when I looked on LinkedIn and Twitter, I realized that so many journalists have this this link to think tanks like this. Um, and to me, that's a problem because it's obviously a big conflict of interest. Yeah. And I mean, we're, we're seeing this all over the place. We're seeing the <laughs> fact that the, there's an executive at Twitter that was a, you know, a British intelligence officer. I mean, right. like it's it's mm -hmm. it's pervasive. It goes into the, the major universities yeah. like they're big... they're everything. And so, I mean, we've seen this. This is how they sell war. And this is how, like, why we haven't had more investigations about what happened with Jeffrey Epstein when the CEO mm -hmm. of Disney kills us an interview with Virginia Roberts three mm -hmm. years before it comes out. Uh, and then we find out his wife was, was a socialite pals with Jeline Maxwell, who mm -hmm. Virginia Roberts uh, said in a sworn deposition, you know, uh, raped and trafficked her. Mm -hmm. So where else are you seeing this as you as you started to uncover more and you're seeing sort of mm -hmm. this 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 bigger uh, uh, network? Where mm -hmm. where else? How else are you seeing this? Well, so I think it it just kind of it's become it's very obvious now because we've got so many stories where 
everyone knows that they're false, you know? And I think this is a really interesting moment at the moment because it's not just like there's one issue. Usually you have um, people that follow Syria, they're kind of annoyed with the media and then it will kind of die down. But right now you've got this situation where you've got people that care about Syria, anyone who cares about Tulsi Gabbard, anyone who cares about Bernie Sanders, anyone who cares about Bernie Corbyn, anyone who cares about Julian Assange, Jeffrey Epstein, you have all these groups of people that are aware of how the media is kind of lying to them. So now you, I think it's kind of this moment where everyone's sort of realizing that there's actually a, a wider pattern here and people are starting to wake up to how it's how it's working. And I, I think these, these things are all definitely related because it's anything that is against US corporate interests or US military interests. Um, I mean, there's credible evidence that Jeffrey Epstein was an Israeli spy, for example. Um, I don't know how much you've looked into that. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Epstein was, was, you know, definitely had ties to Mossad, but also he had ties to the CIA, apparently. I mean, it was Acosta who said in his 2009, when he was uh, first arrested for mm -hmm. being a pedophile in Florida, it was Acosta who was told, back off, he's an intelligence asset. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Yeah. And that's why Epstein got this sweetheart deal 10 years ago and basically was allowed mm -hmm. to go continue to traffic children while technically mm -hmm. under custody. He could get he was he was allowed 13 hours a day to go do whatever he wanted. And then he'd come back at night. It was it was preposterous. And you see this you see the same names start to pop up. Right. Mm -hmm. You see Acosta, you see William Barr and you see all these these same names pop, pop up, you know, and it's not. It's obviously not, it, well, I mean, it's a lot with the American empire, but it's just the, also the mm -hmm. global ruling class who all profit mm -hmm. from war. They all mm -hmm. profit from arms dealing and they mm -hmm. profit from the debt of war. And, mm -hmm. and, and sex trafficking is a, is, is a part of their business. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing you're seeing. So anybody that calls it out, Tulsi Gabbard is uh, against, you know, she's against, you know, regime change wars. Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. is against Jeremy Corbyn, all those people you listed, they're all against mm -hmm. it. Julian Assange, obviously, Chelsea Manning. And they're all getting targeted now in the same way. Mm -hmm. And from what mm -hmm. you're telling us, by basically the, the same the same ring of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's also, I said it's kind of reaching this really important point, but I also think it's really important actually because um, my understanding is that the kind of global power structures are really shifting to in terms of China is now, um, you know, really kind of growing its, its influence across the world through this Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so I guess we have this evolution in empire where the U.S. empire was trying to uh, protect its interests through military force. But China has become so economically powerful that all it's doing to get governments on, on board with their policies is to say, we're going to lend you some money for roads and schools and infrastructure, and then, you know, we'll treat you decently, and then hopefully your government is aligned with us. Um, the government, the US and the UK government way seems to be is we're going to pay terrorists to overthrow your, uh, your leaders and hope that your country falls in line with what we want. And <laughs> that, that system's clearly not working. Yeah, um, yeah. But um, I think it's really dangerous at the moment, actually, because not only are we having this media silence, but in the other direction, you've got this complete clampdown on freedom of speech, which is the thing that should be the most sacred thing in the UK and the US. I mean, it's the First Amendment. And, you know, it's, it's the reason that our countries grew to the place that, where they are, you know, if you look at it historically. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, if we lose that, we're going to kind of, keep shrinking and descend into something that's quite ugly and tyrannical, I think. Um, and I think this kind of, you know, the Julian Assange case is, is going to be, it's going to be make or break for, I think the future of the U S in my opinion, um, if he's prosecuted, I think that's the end of the U S empire and the, the new century, whatever you want to call it, you know? Well, yeah, it's the last leg of this, like, uh, let's pretend America's the, the, democratic, you know, uh, refuge. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we can't sit there and, you know, we, we, our selective outrage is so preposterous, you know, mm -hmm. um, we're all, we wrung our hands over Kosoji and it was awful. They, he was, he was butchered, but, but the Saudis mm -hmm. are our ally because, yeah. you know, we get their oil and they buy our arms and then 
let them go and we support them wholeheartedly into committing a complete um, genocide in Yemen and no one seems to have a problem with that. And mm -hmm. yet we don't talk about Serena Shim, who, you know, mm -hmm. uncovered, she was a journalist, grew up in Detroit, an American working for Press TV, discovered that the uh, America w was letting, was funneling ISIS through American bases in Turkey into Syria. And oh, mm -hmm. weird, she had a wacky car accident that's never been investigated, ever. And right. no one talks about that. When everyone was all up in arms about Kosoji, I was like, okay, good. Let's add Sh Serena Shim to the list. And also, too, no one seems to be... Susie Dawson. Pardon? About Susie Dawson. Oh, Susie Dawson, of course. Susie Dawson, I, I, Susie Dawson told me about Serena Shim when I was interviewing her. She's in asylum and, and seeking for, uh, asylum in Russia. You can go to protectsusie.com to help support what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's very little talk of Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange, who were both in prison for being mm -hmm. whistleblowers. There's all this whistleblower talk and this ridiculous impeachment trial that's just a distraction. Mm -hmm. It's a distraction from the leaked OPCW reports. It's a distraction mm -hmm. from Epstein. It's a distraction from just the trillions of dollars we spend, as you say, America mm -hmm. goes to countries and say, you have resources we want, and if their leaders don't play ball, well, then we help overthrow them. Mm -hmm. And then that we put in a tyrant who can do whatever they want. We mm -hmm. don't care. Yeah, and the thing is, America could get away with that before, but right. it's, it's not going to be able to anymore. Um, you know, China and Russia's influence in the Middle East, for example, is going to slowly keep pushing America out. Iraq has signed a deal with um, with China with this Belt and Road Initiative, you know, after all the money and all the years we spent there, um, in just a couple of years, now their government is pretty much completely aligned with China's. Um, yeah, so it's kind of precarious times, I guess. Yeah, well, how do you see this playing out? Seeing all this information that you have uncovered, what happened to you, basically? So did you lose your job or? Well, I resigned. Um, okay. I kind of tweeted it out and thankfully I got a lot of support, which I, I didn't know how it would go, but um, you know the support I got was great. Um, now I'm kind of just trying to think about next steps. Um, I've been kind of contacted by so many people that actually <clears throat> have experienced the same thing, and other journalists that have spoken about, out about certain issues and then were forced to quit or lose their jobs. And so my understanding of, of everything has, has changed so much, and. I really think it's it's way worse than I ever thought. You know, when I when I quit, I was thinking, oh, I un uncovered this big big corruption, and then actually two or three days later, I was just realizing that I've only scratched the surface of um, all this, you know, all the stuff and all the lying that's going on. Um, in terms of where it's going to go, I think, you know, I'm I'm kind of keeping optimistic. I think you know shows like yours and Joe Rogan and Jimmy Dore and Aaron Mate people, you know, there's lot, there's, there seems to be a, a number of solid voices, um, even, you know, with Tulsi, you know, people that are speaking honestly about this. And I think the awareness seems to be growing. Um, I just, that's, I guess, my only hope is that, um, I guess, America and the UK kind of have this sort of reawakening of who do they want to be going forward um, and kind of rethinking the, the nature of their empires and what their place in the world. Um, but the thing is, I guess the, the problem is that we've got how our, how our um, systems operate is that we don't have one person that's really on top. We've got a range of companies um, that all they really care about is that they're kind of short term profits. And it's the decision making is tense essentially. And we know this is that it's really the companies that dictate American foreign policy and American, you know, home policy or whatever. So <clears throat> unless that problem of essentially getting the money out of politics is fixed and it's fixed really quickly to the point that uh, the policies that actually American people want instead of what the corporations want, I think that's the only kind of hope for America, really. Um, otherwise, all, all of your decisions are going to be made by Raytheon and you know, Boeing and stuff. So yeah. uh, no, you're absolutely right. I think it's, it's funny. I talk to so many people who say similar to what you said, like we're at this very critical moment where mm -hmm. if we don't do something severe in terms of radical change, like it's mm -hmm. the, the climate change and you know, the U S military is the number one polluter on the planet. 
um, mm -hmm. and just this mindless, do anything to get profits, corporate ma attitude that is pervasive in the military, in, in the war machine, in pharmaceutical company, in bank, in all of them. I mean, it does the private mm -hmm. prisons, it doesn't matter what, what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, it's it's journalists such as yourself speaking up. I mean, give I, you know, I give you a lot of credit because a lot of journalists were put in the position you were put in and went, okay, I'll play ball, I wanna keep mm -hmm. my job. Yeah. And I guess I was slightly fortunate just because I'm a little bit younger. I don't have a family and children, but, um, um, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, and just, I guess to go to your point about, um, you know, for kind of radical change, cause it, I was someone that was very left wing in the past and I was one of those kind of overthrow capitalism and I wanted to go out to protests and all that kind of thing. Uh -huh. But, um, with a little bit of time, I've kind of learned that's not the most, uh, effective way of influencing change and I th I guess maybe just to share a message of how I think the best way is to do it is actually it needs to be every single person in their individual lives like there's no point you know trying to change the entirety of the system it's just impossible I think each person in their own individual lives and then in their decisions needs to be you know being a bit more truthful about what's going on and kind of you know, each if you know, instead of just one person trying to change the world, it's each person in their own community trying to actually be a bit more honest, speaking about these, you know, corporations and Julian Assange and all these things. I think it can only really happen at, at like a personal level. It's not going to be going to uh, Washington D.C. to protest mm -hmm. with a thousand people. I don't think that's going to change anything. Yeah, it's an interesting. You know, I, we, I have this discussion a lot with a lot of different people. What what will do it? And I don't know. I think personally it's a combination of, because electoral politics on its own isn't going to do it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But I think at the, at the, at the, 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 the start of it is, is stuff like this. People such mm -hmm. as yourself coming forward, uh, my show, other shows, the shows you name, Jimmy, Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is to put those shows out there and to get more people to wake up because we've all been propagandized. We've all been lied to for so long Mm -hmm. That that's part of it. You know, I just see people on social media, oh, how's Bernie going to pay for his Medicare for all? And nobody from that crowd is asking, how are we going to pay for this war in Iran that they so badly want? How are we going to pay yeah. for all this stuff? Nobody's even paying attention to the fact that $6 trillion, the Federal Reserve just gave Wall Street over the course of about three weeks, $6 trillion. Just gave it to them. Because the Federal Reserve can just do that. They can just create currency and just give $6 trillion. And we're sitting there screaming about, oh, how are we going to pay for Medicare for all and this impeachment yeah. trial? Adam Schiff, in his district in Los Angeles, there's people living in tents. There's mm -hmm. tent cities. Why doesn't he fix that? How about a, a, a congressional hearing about that? But we, mm -hmm. you know, we can't get into that. You know, the, the, it's always yeah. a distraction. All of the, the wealthy, Trump, the Clintons, all friends with Epstein, Prince Andrew, they're all, they were all part of a global billionaire sex trafficking ring and we can but we're not allowed to talk about that that's just like so that's the key to me i think is to get the information out there and get more people to wake up because the more people that do wake up there's a lot of ways to do resistance it, yeah it's, it's not just i was talking to Susie dawson about this she's like look the ruling class and the deep state they know how to subvert the big rallies at this at the public squares and stuff and i'm not discouraging people from doing those but it's the the things that they don't know how to deal with. They couldn't figure out Occupy Wall Street. They couldn't figure out WikiLeaks. They're like, what the hell is this? So I think it's all these little things and all these ways and mainly to get people to wake because we've all been lied to. Like we are yeah. on a daily and you're, you're exposing how mm -hmm. pervasive it is and how mm -hmm. overreaching this massive umbrella mm -hmm. pushes this, this, this narrative that war is good and they're, they're bad and we need money for this. So, um, uh, I really appreciate your time today. Is there anything, any, any, any closing thoughts you want to leave with people and also where they can, uh, find your work if you're, if you're doing more journalism online? Sure. I guess one final thing is that, um, another way of also going about this problem is that realizing that, um, you know, America shouldn't have this massive divide of, of left and right. I think lots of people have spoken about this, but it's it's definitely one of the main issues that could just keep getting further till it descends into civil war. I think people need to start realizing again that, you know, whoever they're talking to 
doesn't matter what their political beliefs are is that they're still their beliefs are actually still valid and they're derived in you know with good intentions or at least give people the benefit of that doubt before talking to them and then i'm sure a lot of people will start to realize that they have a lot more in common than they than they than they think um in terms of support um my website's tarikhadad.com um twitter tarik underscore haddad um yeah, if, if people could support on Patreon, that would be great as well. Um, all the same name as well on my website. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for being on the show. Everybody watching, I'll, I'll, I'll put uh, his website in the show notes so you can be more familiar with his work if you're not already. And, and, and I appreciate what you, it's a great point. They want to keep us divided. Red state, blue state, you know, black, white, male, female, this okay boomer thing, that's to keep us divided. Millennial boomer fight, that, that is all to keep us divided. So I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, and thank you everybody for watching the show. Like, share, and subscribe these videos. This is how we get independent media out there. I don't get money from the corporate media. Tarek doesn't get money from the corporate media. So going to my Patreon, my Rockfin pages, which are all in the links below, and then checking us out uh, on the Progressive Comedy Tour. We're going to be in Arizona in February, Florida in March, and the Pacific Northwest in April. We got dates all the way through into October. So go to GrahamElwood.com. Thanks for watching, everybody. You're all making Gotham great again.